going to talk a little bit about this. So the uh, purpose then is to learn the basics of sleep history and physical examination and outline a relationship to other systems. Measuring instruments commonly used in sleep medicine assessments and review principles of diagnostic testing. So uh, who could tell me when sleep medicine was determined to be a, that was, it was deemed by about 19 people to say we're a specialty? Hmm? I'm guessing in the 80s, but I'm yeah, not. 19, 1981. And what did, what was it what was it developed to to uh, in the vernacular to pimp? There's another specialty it tries to pimp all the time. It was called neurophysiology. So neurophysiology used to be, a, and even in the 80s, neurophysiology came back and said, well, now we're neurophysiology and sleep because neurophysiology also has EEG interpretation, has sleep interpretation, and has everything else. But uh, of those 19 people, five of them were neurophysiologists and they realized that neurophysiologists did even think about what were sleep illnesses, sleep disorders. They were only interested in doing testing. They weren't interested really in treating um, and determining what the management was. I'm a little harsh, but when you look back at the history of neurology, really in the 70s and 80s, they were the supreme diagnosticians. And everybody said, well, they knew what it was, but they didn't know what to do about it. <laughs> so sleep medicine came out in 1981. 1986 was the first meeting there was a group called American Sleep Disorders Association, and that went on until they didn't like that name because the American S A S D A is the is uh, is uh, is something that is there's a dental association that's called that. So American Academy of Sleep Medicine in about 1996. So let's try to see if we can define sleep health. I mentioned this before. Sleep health. Uh, uh, in, in, or health in general is what the World Health Organization is. It's not the World Illness Association. It's not the World Sleep Apnea Association. It's not the World Insomnia Association. It's the World Health Association. So in every domain, uh, this Swiss-based uh, organization tries to define health and improve health, but they first have to know what health is. And they start by describing health as a state of well being and distinguishing it from the absence of disease, noting physical, mental, and social well being that can, at least in theory, be quantified, and placing health in the context not only of the individual but society. So, how does that map on to sleep health? Well, in 19, uh, 2015, 2016, the sleep field was asked to propose a definition for sleep health. Uh, because no one really knew what it was. And the NIH didn't know what it was. So it's multidimensional pattern of sleep wakefulness adapted to individual social environmental demands that promotes physical and mental well being. Good sleep health is characterized by subjective satisfaction, appropriate timing, adequate duration high efficiency, and sustained alertness during waking hours. So as you remember, they uh, said that at least in theory, it should be able to be quantified. And so a couple of years went through uh, and people finally uh, centered around some work that defined what they thought was a sleep health questionnaire. It's called, are you sated? But really often it's shortened to just sated, S-A-T-E-D. The three ways you can answer it rarely, never, sometimes, or usually always. Regularity. Is your bedtime and wake time occurring at the same time within one hour every day? Satisfaction. Are you satisfied with your sleep? Alertness. Do you stay awake all day without dozing? Timing. Are you asleep or trying to sleep between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m.? 
That's usually the head scratcher right there. We can go back. Efficiency, do you spend less than 30 minutes awake at night? And this includes the time it takes to fall asleep and the awakenings from sleep. And duration, do you sleep between six and eight hours per day? Anyone have any questions about that? I just see a bunch of criteria for the different disorders right. in there. You know, screen for narcolepsy, the 30 minute rule, or sorry, insomnia. Um, yeah, so it sort of shakes all that stuff together. And, and they do what they did is they took like 30 sleep questionnaires that were done in 20, 30 different studies and shook them all together, did cluster analysis and came up with these being the entry points for all these illnesses. Now, the problem with this is that, uh, well, the healthy people were healthy because some sleep doc said they were healthy, right? <laughs> they didn't fill out the questionnaire. So everybody entering an insomnia trial they don't, don't have a lot of controls. All they have is controls that are insomniacs or sleep aptics or narcoleptics or, or somebody like that. So it's been deployed now for almost a, a year, year and a half, and there's some literature on it. It's, the, it's worth a, a complete talk because it's uh, quite, uh, quite intriguing. And I deploy it even on the telephone. I deploy it in the, in the clinic. And, and I, 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 I do it really with a paper because I haven't gotten an IRB yet to be able to do it. But it could be done online. It could be done all sorts of things. You could do big data here. You could invite the entire uh, neurology board certified group to do it and see what they did. Um, but regularity is tough, right? Um, it, it really sort of gets to it gets to shift work. It gets to all sorts of things. Satisfaction is probably the most important uh, kind of global feeling about it. And that's why they think that sated, S-A-T-E-D, is better. Alertness, it's not as, uh, it just, you sometimes have to explain to people what dozing is all about. Timing, efficiency, duration. So uh, as opposed to other kinds of questionnaires, and, and you'll be filling them out because most, most of the questionnaires that are in front of all the EMRs are, are kind of done five, six, seven years ago, in which it was always thought you could ask 30 questions. If you couldn't ask 30 questions, you should ask 40 questions. <laughs> So you'll find regularity breaking it down. I think it's a nice little questionnaire. But anyway, I digress because that's not really what we're talking about today. We're talking about how to diagnose illness and what are the dimensions of illness. But this is the dimension of health. So the first is excessive daytime sleepiness and fatigue. And um, you, you guys will have to know how to define and differentiate between the symptoms of fatigue and sleepiness. So does anybody have a simple way of doing that? Other than throw a questionnaire, you're sitting in front of your aunt and they say, oh my goodness, you know, I can't get anything done. I'm so fatigued. Just ask them if they're about to fall asleep or if they just feel tired, run down, you know. Right, right. Do you ever fall asleep? And where do you fall asleep? And how do you fall asleep? And where did it start? And what's its severity? And how it affects your life? We have scales. We have a fatigue severity scale and an upward sleep a severity scale, upward sleepiness scale, sorry. Uh, fatigue severity scale is something like nine items and Epworth is eight items, three each. And they really do capture different things. And you could find uh, narcoleptics that come in and they have a high Epworth and a high fatigue and you treat, their, treat them with alerting agents and their Epworth goes down, their fatigue stays the same. Then there are a bunch of quality of life instruments, generic, uh, and then there's sleep disorder, dis disorder specific. So the generic one is FOSQ, Functional Outcome of Sleep Questionnaire. And the uh, uh, 
and the other is a Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index. And then there are some that are specific about you know, how sleep apnea affects your life. And then about the other thing on excessive sleepiness is that the major risk for sleepiness is accidents and crashes. So in accidents and crashes, you really sort of need an open-ended question. Do you have any trouble, uh, you know, do you have any? I, I usually break it down into active and passive sleepiness. Passive sleepiness means you're a passenger in the car. Active sleepiness means that you're a driver. And active sleepiness in, uh, at home means that uh, you fall asleep when everybody else is talking. And active sleepiness is you fall asleep when you're supposed to be talking. And another example of active sleepiness is falling asleep on the telephone talking to your mother. Um, I think you have to have these real world sort of examples that you can pull out and talk to people about. Now these scales are pretty, um, they're, sometimes they're pretty long. Uh, fatigue and Epworth are okay, but FOSCU is probably four or five pages. PSQI is about six pages. PSQI takes about Oh, 10 minutes, 12 minutes to fill, fill out. And you can, you can hear those patients in your waiting room muttering about those things. So they're usually, uh, usually put into to, to trials that, uh, that are uh, drug trials or clinical trials. So the other big, big group is sleep-related breathing disorders. Remember, of the daytime sleepiness, sleep apnea is the most common medical disorder, and the most common disorder in period is, is, is restricted sleep or lack of sleep. And so then you kind of go into sleep-related breathing disorders, your initial evaluation. The purpose of that is to determine pretest probability of disease. And that's a new patient who walks in with a stamped on their head, rule out OSA, or I, my doctor says I should talk to you or things of that sort. Now, maybe they don't know they have it or they haven't been specific for it, but you wanna have a pretest probability of, of sleep apnea because it is very, very common. And so even if they come in with insomnia, you should look for the sleep apnea. 20% uh, of sleep apnea patients complain of insomnia. And the risk of sleep uh, disorder breathing, excessive daytime sleepiness, snoring, apneas, elevated BMI, neck circumference, maybe hypertension, cardiovascular disease are incorporated into clinical prediction models. Now I'd call those risks because they're what you elicit from the patient when they're awake. And so far you don't have anything in there that in which they are asleep. So other things that we talk about is nocturia, rhinitis, dry mouth, morning headaches, ankle swelling, angina. What if they don't have any of the core risk ones and they only have the others? Well, there are small studies. There are indications that if uh, you get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and you're below the age of uh, 70, that it's sleep apnea until proven otherwise. It's not it's not uh, prostate uh, enlargement. And, and that's, that's, that, was, that was done a lot. And uh, we get very few referrals from, from a urologists, even for that. Associated conditions, hypertension, cardio, car, uh, cardiovascular disease, heart failure, atrial fibrillation, medications, insomnia itself, restless leg syndrome, because they say they kick as well. And you want to define from these symptoms, what do you want to track? How do you know they're better? What, what do they do? That, and that's one of the reasons that are you say it helps me understand things because they can have all these things and still have pretty good sleep or they could have very few of these things and have terrible sleep. But you need to identify what they do first. So when you see these patients, then education, education, education. You want to educate yourself. You want to educate the patient. You want to educate the family, particularly if they're if they're sleepy. You want to be able to uh, the, the the core 
principles or weight loss and exercise, which is really just as much hard to achieve as, as, as everybody thinks they are. And at one time there was, a, you know, I, I thought maybe we should have a certificate in, in bariatric medicine as part of our sleep medicine training. Because, there, and I think that may come up again because there are some newer treatments for obesity some of the diabetes uh, medications that can be repurposed for, for weight loss, which we might be using. Okay, sleep-related disorders, anything here? It's much more, you know, 10 years ago, we have people coming in from family medicine, or internal medicine, they go, they go, duh, I missed all these people, I did this. Insomnia and circadian rhythm disorders, I put them together uh, the reason for that is that they kind of uh, co-mingle and that uh, the most common thing for as an illness, that is a, 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 a ISD uh, three, uh, International Classification of Sleep Disorders three, is that circadian rhythms and insomnia uh, are separate and there are disorders rather than complaints. And, it, and much of this, is done by history. And it may not be done by history on the first visit. You wanna know a little bit about their pre-sleep rituals and that's in our, some of our questionnaires, their sleep anxieties and attitudes, their schedule, their naps, their sleep hygiene, and their subjective sleep quality. Fatigue versus sleepiness is important here. In terms of sleepiness, the insomnia patient, even if they have uh, sleep apnea, are more likely to have a low Epworth and a high Epworth. And uh, they're more likely to com 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 complain of fatigue. And whether that's through, uh, what that's through is, is, is not very clear, but the, the current thinking, um, at least here in our place and in certain places around the country is that it's due to brain inflammation. Now that's a catch-all phrase, but you can now measure, uh, you can measure edema in the brain, you can measure the, the connections, the connectivity and the robustment, uh, robustness of, of axons that connect nucle nuclei in the brain. And you can also see those change in, in and either deteriorate in certain sleep, in certain other neurologic disorders, or get better. We've showed that in chronic fatigue syndrome, that a graded exercise in those people that did not have sleep disorders improved resting brain function and decreased brain edema and signs of inflammation. So I think in the future, five, six years from now, we'll probably be doing more fMRIs and to be able to identify what the degree, you know, mild, moderate, severe of brain inflammation is all about, and then connected to conditions that are related to either acute or chronic fatigue. But in terms of uh, uh, identifying them, you have to get this circadian rhythm out of the way. Directed assessment for medical disorders, mental disorders, medications, family history, use of sleep log. A sleep log can be done in paper and pencil. And a person it can do that, they're very, very helpful. And um, we'll, we'll try to pull some of those out and, and bring them around. Everybody probably should think about doing a sleep log on themselves. And the family history is very important. We're born with a biological propensity for insomnia. Extreme form is idiopathic insomnia, also noted in circadian rhythm. So you wanna follow these longitudinally. We have actigraphy. The problem is not, it's used at the VA because uh, we, have, we have instruments. It's not used at either Metro or UH because uh, there is no uh, code to be able to charge for it. So the hospital doesn't want to buy the, buy the actigraphs. They are relatively cheap now. Um, we're thinking as a group that will buy it as a practice. Each person, each attending, buy a couple of them and put them in there. But you know that you'll lose about 10% every six to 12 months because people won't bring them back. 
So you sort of have to kind of figure out, you know, who you want to give it to and what you want to do. So the other extreme is hypersomnia, excessive or daytime sleepiness interferes with daily life. And you usually, in hypersomnolence, is to determine the differential diagnosis. So I want you guys to practice doing differential diagnosis on every patient that comes in, even if they're follow-ups. Uh, mainly because there are usually, uh, in, in any sleep clinic, every patient has probably three to four sleep diagnoses that you could make, of which you'll focus on one of them. The most common being poor sleep hygiene, a diagnosis that you can get paid for. But nevertheless, it, uh, it, it's there because you can identify things that uh, can improve sleep by just a behavioral uh, assessment. So evaluation is detailed description of sleepiness, when, why, where, we talked about that. The narcolepsy symptoms, uh, hallucinations, sleep paralysis, cataplexy and sleep fragmentation. Poor sleep is part of the uh, narcoleptic, uh, narcoleptic uh, uh, syndrome, medication review, and, and you're going to see this a lot at the, at the VA, but it's probably present over at the other institutions of patients that get put on medications for sleep or get put on pay medications for mood disorders that have lots of sleepiness. And then the review of medical disorders, head trauma. Head trauma, it really doesn't usually come on. The sleepiness comes on. It takes 6, 12 months before it starts to manifest itself. Another indication of how brain plasticity after an injury might lead to a sleep disorder. Diabetes, hypothyroid, fibromyalgia, chronic pain, autoimmune disorders, chronic hypoxemia. Now, hypoxemia doesn't give you sleepiness. Uh, it's interesting. COPD patients are generally not sleepy. But they have sleep fragmentation and they're hypoxic at night. And then certainly depression, and depression, depression, depression. Got just a few more. Sleep-related movement disorders, you know? Do you, do you make any unusual movements during sleep? Do you, do you, what sort of things do you have? And who, who tells you? Is it part of the presenting complaint? Is, is I hit my wife or is it uh, are my legs kick all night or is it uh, in part of uh, a, a history for sleep apnea or for other disorders? Evaluation includes detailed description of the complaint, character, timing, onsets, frequency, severity. And there is a RLS severity scale. It's an international severity scale. And, it, and the two dimensions are how often it occurs and how much does it disturb your sleep. There are about five questions there, and you'll see those in, in drug trials for RLS. You'll see that in, uh, in uh, it's usually not deployed clinically, but it probably could be. So you, we, you know, we could deploy lots of questionnaires. It's just a question of, of uh, how do we deploy them and how do we do that? If it's not the primary complaint or the patient not forthcoming, they should always be asked about it because restless legs is fairly common and often they don't think that that's a sleep problem. And they may have been uh, taken care of by other people who, uh, who you can assess whether or not that you thought they made the right decision or they made the right medication choice or, or that uh, that's something you have to move, 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 uh, move on. Uh, there's nocturnal leg kicking by itself, which we always argue about whether it's really a disease. And then there's tooth gr teeth grinding or bruxism. Bruxism is a, you know, if you read your chapter on, on bruxism, you, you, you'll find they're thinking about stuff that you never even thought would be involved with just grinding your teeth at night. A lot of, uh, of serotonergic regulation of the motor nucleus that involves uh, the upper airway muscles. And remember, chewing and teeth grinding and swallowing are coordinated brainstem activities. And so it must be the activation of, a, of networks and of, 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 of pattern generation uh, generators that, that end up uh, producing that particular activity during sleep. And you're trying to interrupt it. 
parasomnias. I, I don't know where the origin of that term came. Para means around and parasomnia sleep, but it, it's just things that go bump in the night. Initial evaluation often diagnoses the, the problem, but more frequently sets up a different, differential diagnosis. It used to be that you could take certain problems like REM behavior disorder and you wouldn't have to do sleep studies because they were so stereotypic in their presentation. But they want you to do sleep studies now because there is a differential diagnosis of seizures and there are uh, often uh, other behaviors during sleep and that need to be distinguished. We don't currently really sleep, uh, distinguish the treatment of non-REM and REM Parasomnia is too much, and the, and the initial, the, the initial is to look for drugs, and the second one is to safety for the, the patient, and then you go on to other drug therapy, like we talked about in the melatonin paper. But you'd like to have a detailed description of the behavior with timing, onset, frequency, severity, because sometimes your medication will reduce it to a particular level. And here's where another sleep diary is useful because if they're having it uh, two or three times uh, a, a week, you're probably not going to catch it in full-blown manifestation in a sleep study, which is done on, you know, on, on some Tuesday, on some month, on some whatever it is. But, but you can track how bad it is from that perspective. And the other is really to what extent do they, do they they harm themselves or others because many of these medications they don't they, they no longer get out of bed and do something but they do something that, that really bothers the bed partner or 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 the other people in the room physical examination just a skill and general medical examination is assumed the uh has a very detailed sleep examination, but each of those things that you click, um, I don't know if there's really an evidence-based reason to, to, to put them into the into things right now. It may be in the future, but not now. Then sleep apnea specific examination of the upper airway, and we'll talk about what that is, and that's getting more and more complex. Certainly a review of pulmonary cardiovascular and neurologic examination. A complete neurologic evaluation has, even in the places that are primary sleep programs in neurology, they, they say don't spend your time on a neurologic examination. Unless uh, in the course of sort of talking to a patient, your antenna go up for something and usually it's either seizures or it's Parkinson's. Sure, they because mainly because uh, these are not undifferentiated people. They're usually sent to you for uh, after they've been seen by by somebody, and and most commonly they have other um, they have a known diagnosis. So sure, you can confirm uh, cogwheeling, you can confirm the gait, and and the other is you pull out your your sort of Parkinson's. Uh, at least your poor man's Parkinson's assessment for people who have REM behavior disorder because the, the patient and their family sort of think that they're automatically next week going to develop Parkinson's. So you sort of watch those every, uh, every, uh, every year. The psychiatric evaluation, there's no sleep specific psychiatric evaluation questionnaire, but the, we always now have to ask about depression at the VA because it's so common. And it's, we're unfortunately one of those subspecialties that's tagged with every patient that we talk to. We should at least assess or reassess or look at for, uh, for suicidality. Uh, they're in the midst of about a two year cycle of doing this everyone does it. Now, it's not everyone because the primary care physicians have stopped doing it. Neuro the neurologists have stopped doing it. And so, we're, but we're the seen because sleep disorders and insomnia is so uh, intertwined with suicidality that we're, we feel a little bit of an obligation to continue. But though, there will be, whether or not that big effort 
reduced suicidality in the VA population remains to be determined. And you have to remember that about three or four years ago, uh, right before uh, Trump, that was a big push by the, by the VA, a tremendous push by the VA. I mean, it was, it was almost painful as to how they were pushing it out. And then they threw out the, the, the director of the VA, who was a doctor, put in an administrator, and it just faded away. So we'll see how that turns out. Sleep apnea specific is vital signs, obesity, cyanosis, mass like faces. Uh, that is, they're so tired, they don't know what to do. Tremors, downs, faces, hypothyroid. I mean, these are things that you would have picked up in your general uh, you know, medical school or, or primary core specialties to one degree or another. And the HENT examination, we'll go over that again, but mid-face hypoplasia, which is common in the Chinese and Asian population, retronathia, micronathia, overbite, nasal inspections. We probably could do a better job, and particularly all this stuff when we send a, a referral to, to the uh, ENT people for evaluation for surgery. We probably should look over those and say, is there an anatomic problem that we think we want them to assess or is this a more functional issue that they would be able to, uh, to know that, that they don't make terribly different decisions about it, but it's it, one thing to have enlarged tonsils and another thing to have your tonsils be just a little bit bigger. Now, uh, in, the, in the 90s, they took, uh, I think it was something like 40 patients with sleep apnea, and they had them come to, uh, to a ear, nose, and throat convention the day before, and they went into the, they sat around in these different tables, and they had uh, 10 different ENT people go and examine these patients and predict whether they had sleep apnea by just looking at them and examining them. They didn't get to look down into the nose and they all complained that they couldn't do that. But what we wanted to do is have somebody that really had a knowledge of looking at the anatomy of the upper airway, and having that sort of neural network to kind of put themselves into what the mid-face uh, hypoplasia is, what the distance between the hyoid and the mental how many finger breaths it is, which is what they talk about. And it turned out to be that it was about, they were about 60% right uh, between people that had sleep apnea and didn't have sleep apnea, which I, you know, the reason I reviewed that again is that uh, I'm really as, as much interested in, in why those people with certain risk factors like obesity, like uh, retronathia, like mid-face hypoplasia, like uh, even nasal polyps, uh, how, why don't they have sleep apnea? And what protects them from having that particular nocturnal disturbance disease? Neck, neck size, all right. So neck size was a very important uh, issue in the 80s. It's, uh, it's, we, we kind of measure it, it's part of the stop bang, you know, the, uh, the stop bang, uh, everybody, uh, uh, Everybody know what stop bang is? Yes. If, if, you, if, you had all, if you had all your light, your, your things on, you could raise your hand and I could see what's happening. Right? But everybody know what it is? Well, the stop bang, the N is neck circumference. And, and when was the last time you actually saw a neck circumference in a stop bang? Not very often, right? Now you sometimes can ask, uh, a man, what the neck size, the collar size is, and whether it's changed, but uh, but that gets you into all sorts of interesting things. So it's really the stop bag, S T O P B A G, <laughs> you do. So you have to be careful. So neck size is there. Now you could be morbidly muscular and still have a neck size of eighteen, and you can be morbidly obese and have a neck size of eighteen. So Arnold Schwarzenegger, when he was a, a bodybuilder, had a neck size of 18 and a half. Now his waist was something like 22 inches or something like that. But <laughs> you could be morbidly muscular. So 
uh, neck size is, is not that important. I, we have not been able to map neck size onto a property in the airway that produces sleep apnea. Because about 15% of people that have a BMI of 35, which I think we all would agree would be pretty big, don't have sleep apnea. And even when you get the BMI of 40, about 10% don't have sleep apnea. A close link between important sleep disorders and disorders from these other systems, probably by direction. That is, if you have a stroke, it probably affects how your brainstem is coordinating your breathing. And if you have a coordinating your breathing for many years, you may have a stroke. Same thing with cardiovascular and with some of the pulmonary diseases. So in pulmonary, we're going to go and Faisal, you know, will know this stuff a lot, hypercapnic and chronic respiratory failure, asthma, COPD, PAH, sleep apnea is present in all those conditions. And um, there's more and more evidence that the identification of sleep disordered breathing, which is the generic term for apneas, hypoventilation, hypopneas, and other uh, respiratory control problems, that those things have an important uh, consequence on the, on the progression of, of disease. Now, the distinction is they probably don't cause the COPD. And sometimes people get a little, a little crazy about it. The cardiovascular people, they have a person with an injection fraction of 30% or 25% and they're short of breath and they go, oh, it must be the sleep apnea. And you go, well, you know, they'd probably be a lot better if they had an ejection fraction that's, that's, that's higher. And remember that, that uh, sleep apnea in the, in, in the heart failure population can be eliminated by heart transplant. So you just have to kind of take, take it in stride. But, you know, uh, we, we've not been very good in defining what kind of sleep apnea will affect people with heart failure. Uh, and what I mean by that is if you, we tend to overcall sleep apnea. And if you have an apnea hypopnea index of seven, we call it sleep apnea. If you have it 70, we call it sleep apnea. And everything in between. And the, and the cardiovascular people sort of uh, sit there and, and go, well, it's, they have sleep apnea. Why aren't you treating an apnea hypopnea index of seven? You'll say, well, it's because the person hates CPAP, doesn't want to trach doesn't have any teeth for oral appliance. And, uh, you know, and, and I don't think he's a good candidate for surgery. And they go, but that's the reason he's having his trouble. And you go, oh, okay. So that goes back and forth. So you use your history, physical examination and test review to explore these diseases and pre, pre uh, presentation. So you diagnose, you test for common disorders and be able to identify and measure poor control of heart failure. So uh, the pulmonary people know this, that they have to be pretty savvy in how to treat heart failure because uh, people will be sent to them from cardiologists and they're not very well treated for their heart failure. On the other hand, if they had chest pain, they would have been capped in 10 minutes. So, so, so you gotta be careful and you gotta know what they, uh, what they have, or, or the, the patients on COPD, they're not taking their inhalers correctly, or they, they're not on a long acting inhaler. And the people with asthma, uh, in terms of uh, various things, and some, so, you know, somebody put them on, we don't have it anymore, but if, if you came from overseas, you might have treated people with aminophilin. And aminophilin was a really a very good. Uh, maker of insomnia and prednisone in 10% of people given prednisone chronically, they have poor sleep because it, uh, the inflammatory mediators in your brain also tend to regulate sleep as well as tend to make you crazy. So, so you got to remember. Psychiatry. They have similar complaints to fatigue and there's a strong association between diseases, depression, and insomnia. Full mental status is not practical. You need to be able to kind of know what the common mental disorders are. And we're lucky we have Kamal over at the VA because he, he'll take the more uncommon ones, but the common ones that come in, you have to have 
have to have a sense of whether or not they have a major psychiatric disorder or whether or not uh, uh, they have other things going on. And you ha have to kind of use your instinct. The neurologists sort of know a little bit more than the internal medicine and certainly more than the pulmonary people that are away from it. But the two that I've been struck by is uh, people with insomnia that have borderline personality disorders. These guys really are, these, these are, these guys really can give you whiplash trying to treat their sleep because they, they have this underlying tendency to, of the borderline personality to try to bring you in and push you away and bring you in and push you away. And then if they also have some sort of, and they frequently have some sort of uh, psychology background or social work background or things of that sort. And in, in insomnia, they know the medications and they have tried every medication and they know people who have prescribed the medications. And so these are the ones that you uh, need to be very, uh, you, you usually will be alerted to it after the, after the first visit, you sort of start to write your note and you realize that these things are swirling around your head and you wonder if you've been played for something. Then the second visit and they come in and they, they haven't done anything and they tell you you're a bad doctor. And you go, okay. Um, the other condition, which is interesting that Kamal described when he was a fellow over at Metro is a person with the multiple personality disorders. And uh, he brought it up put it in there. And uh, what he found was that uh, this uh, lady who had sleep apnea, uh, in one of her personalities, she would wear her CPAP very well and feel much more refreshed. But in her other personality, she wouldn't wear her CPAP. <laughs> so her adherence when she came in was like 60, 50%. So he, he had her husband uh, write down what personality she was in what day and uh, got the adherence values from the, from the, uh, from the, the machines. And that time it was the chip for almost uh, seven months and could pile up what the A, the, now the AHI, when she wore a machine in any personality was exactly the same, but the time of use was, was uh, radically different. So it, it, the, 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 the point of that case report, other than being kind of interesting, is that the idea is your personality uh, determines, in part, your use of CPAP. And in this case, we had the personalities all in one person. So that was the, that was the fun part of that. Those are the sorts of things that you guys can pick up as fellows when you see these odd and keep asking questions. Working disorders that have a particularly close relationship like depression. Uh, it, it, you're gonna learn more about depression and, and because the medication of the treat depression, can some of them can be used for, 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 for sleep problems and some of them destroy sleep. Categories of psychiatric diseases, we'll go over those. There are screening questions, a variety of scales. There's the depression scales. There's the kudos for suicidality. There's the, these, uh, these are important and, and, and Kamal pulls those out. I don't usually use them, I probably should. And this year I'm gonna be reassessing in all areas of what I do, all my use of questionnaires and trying to get them done on a tablet rather than a, on a piece of paper. Measuring institutes, there are scales, indices, questionnaires, clinical prediction scales. Uh, measuring instruments are commonly used in, uh, for some fatigue, sleepiness, depression, insomnia, tendency for later bedtimes, quality of life, sleep apnea, pretest probability, stop bang, Berlin questionnaire, et cetera. And they uh, really, the, the what you have to think about for all these questionnaires is you have to realize that there are pretest probabilities and reliability, generalizability, validity with respect to scale development and construct content criterion and face validity. There'll be a lecture, we'll talk a, an hour or so on how to create a questionnaire and what sort of things it goes through. Good questionnaires just take an enormous amount of effort. And if, you're, if you don't really understand that, um, you're tempted 
to make a questionnaire. And the most the, the groups that are the most tempted to make a questionnaire are the drug companies that want to have their own questionnaire that they can put into their drug. And they 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 they, they get tripped up all the time by that. So the diagnostic testing is the other part of this. So whereas back here we had construct content, criteria, face validity, generalizability, scale development for the diagnostic testing, Bayes theorem, your pretest probability and your post-test probability, your positive and negative likelihood ratios, 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 your positive and negative predictive value, your sensitivity and specificity, and your decision analysis and decision tree. So in the review that, uh, that Zach did about the different types of, uh, of, of breaking down a PSG, you saw a decision tree that was as, as long as all outdoors, right? But uh, in the clinical arena, one of the things that by the end of the year is not that you'll know exactly how to do it, but you, you will make your own decision tree from start to scratch like a, like a cook but hopefully we'll give you the cookbook that you can sort of look back and say, oh, well, what is it? How did I make that strudel? And boy, I'll make it differently. And this patient is different from anybody else's strudel. Almost at the end here, okay. So the final thing that's new in the last, uh, not new, but it, it focused is this science comes from sleep health is we've got these dimensions of satisfaction, alertness, timing, efficiency, and duration. And that's that, uh, are you sated? And that's what gives you your, your symptoms. So why would you worry about genetic system level processes, health disease, or function if you're sleeping quite well? And you'll see this, and, and Nicoletta, you'll see, get these slides and you'll, you'll be doing this stuff. This is personalized medicine, right? This is the idea about how you get to all this stuff. So I like the idea of are you sated being a, a closing the loop between all these things. So there may be a genetic defect. <laughs> and I, I was in a, a conference with uh, uh, different groups of people looking at different specialties and particularly a practicing psychiatrist with sleep credentials in uh, in Connecticut that was a professor of psychiatry and pharmacology at one a major university on the East Coast for that one one of Ivy League but he he was there for a long time and he was he was sitting there and he was going he's got people now coming in with 23 and me saying, I've got this gene for depression, or I've got this gene for insomnia. Do I have insomnia? Do I have depression? <laughs> now, we have the same thing. We got people coming in and they say, my watch tells me that I'm not sleeping really well. What Can you fix? I, I go, well, I, can, I can't fix your watch. <laughs> But this is what's going to be happening in the future is the personalized medicine, the wearables, the information level that you can find these things. Uh, I think it's important to look for, and we'll talk about genetics, epigenetic, molecular, and cellular processes. I have a map of my cognitive map of how I think disease is, which is a little different from physiology. But you have system level processes. Remember, inflammation, sympathetic nervous system, hormonal responses, and neural circuits. That's what sleep is all about. Sleep apnea, insomnia, hypersomnia. And I, I would not say just sympathetic nervous system, I would say autonomic. There has been a big push in the last 10 years to define in, uh, the autonomic nervous system. Nicoletta probably was immersed in that in Romania because Eastern Europeans that I all know of think of the vagus as the soul of everything. And we should get you to talk about vagal stimulation and how it affects everything. Musa Hashi was one of the people here. He was from Yugoslavia. Um, he worked with us for a long time. He kept talking to us and, and, bring, and, we, and we had uh, graduate students and faculty. There's some around here that are from uh, some of the neurologic institutes in Poland and, and, and Yugoslavia and the Ukraine. And, and they were all talking about the autonomic nervous system. 
I mean, and especially the vagus. And we don't talk about that at all. When was the last time somebody talked about the vagus nerve in your, in your, in your, um, in your program, Nicoletta? I, I, I totally agree with that because I tend to use like this autonomia or autonomic dysfunction, even like when I'm presenting a patient or something and people will look at me like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, and the sympathetic, parasympathetic, so yeah, there was a lot. Like I remember even from like elementary school at biology, right. still talking about that. Zach remembers from elementary school, not, right? Correct? Zero discussion of the sympathetic nervous system in elementary, elementary school, uh, maybe high school. <laughs> I tell you, that's what that's why the U.S. educational system is lagging behind. Doesn't talk about sympathetic and parasympathetic system. They were too busy telling us not to have sex. Right, Faisal. What about you, the Vegas? You have to think about it that uh, that the the whole modern medicine came out of the Middle East. Netta knows that stuff too. Iranian Iranian uh, pictures of people with illness would always show the nerves going through the system, and that happens in India, and it happens in uh, in the in the concepts of yoga and acupuncture and all that. You ever have a lecture on, on a Vegas, Faisal? When was the last time that uh, that uh, one of the pulmonary guys over there talked about the role of the vagus nerve in COPD? That, that, that'd be a fantastic, fantastic lecture. You'd just blow them away. They yawn and they forget it in about five minutes, but that's okay. All right. So the are you sated question here comes around. And, and so I've been using it. I've been really surprised. I got people re referred to me from uh, 